that was yeah, that more, more strong than I intended. <laughs> okay. uh, the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands will come to order. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on investing in wildfire management, ecosystem restoration, and resilient communities, examining implementation of the bipartisan infrastructure law. Under committee rule four, subparagraph F, any oral opening statements at hearings are limited to the chair and the ranking minority member or their designee. This will allow us to hear from our witnesses sooner uh, and help members keep to their schedules. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. Hearing no objection, so ordered. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present here should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Please note that members are responsible for their own microphones, as with our fully in-person meetings. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting, of course. Members can be muted by staff to avoid inadvertent background noise. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing any technical problems should inform committee staff uh, as soon as possible. So with that, I will now uh, recognize myself for an opening statement. And first, let me say thank you uh, to each of the witnesses for being here today and to uh, my fellow colleagues on both sides of the aisle for the Subcommittee on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands Oversight Hearing on Implementation of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Uh, we are happy to be back here in person in the committee room uh, to host uh, this hybrid hearing on a topic that uh, I certainly know merits a high level of interest from members on both sides of the dais and is of particular importance to communities in my state of Colorado. The bipartisan infrastructure law is a historic investment in our country's infrastructure, which included billions of dollars for the Department of Interior and the US Forest Service to support natural infrastructure, to reduce wildfire risk, restore healthy ecosystems, and build safe, resilient communities. In my district in Colorado, Colorado's second congressional district, Communities from the Front Range to the Continental Divide have been deeply impacted by unprecedented wildfires in recent years, including the Marshall Fire in December of 2021, the Cameron Peak Fire in 2020, and the East Troublesome Fire in that year as well. The reality that we are living with throughout the Rocky Mountain West is that wildfires are no longer simply contained to a season. They are year-round. There are no wildfire seasons in Colorado or in the Rocky Mountain West. There are wildfire years. And these fires are now occurring in larger areas at higher intensity, and it is only projected to increase in the coming years as a result of climate change. In my community in Colorado back in December, on New Year's Eve, 1,084 homes were destroyed literally within an 18-hour time period in the most destructive wildfire that has ever occurred in Colorado. We need more federal firefighting resources. We need to invest in our forests. And ultimately, we need to take wildfire resiliency and mitigation seriously for our communities, for our families, for the many people that we represent in the Western United States. That is why, as chair of this subcommittee, uh, we have uh, prioritized wildfire oversight and legislation, including hearings, on Build Back Better, Natural Disasters, Climate Change, the Civilian Climate Corps, Public Lands Management and Workforce, and yes, Forest Management as well. For example, the Joint Chiefs Landscape Restoration Partnership Act, which I was proud to introduce alongside Senator Bennett, was included and funded in the bipartisan infrastructure law. As with the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, and more recently, the Forest Service's ambitious 10-year wildfire plan. The goal is to promote more fire-adapted landscapes and reduce the vulnerability of at-risk communities. The bipartisan infrastructure law combines investments in hazardous fuels, prescribed fire, and fuel break, breaks, rather, alongside programs to reform the wildfire workforce and increase firefighter pay, improve community wildfire defenses, and support more science-based monitoring and ecosystem restoration. The law also funded wildfire response and pre-planning workshops, uh, burned area recovery, and significantly increased uh, funding available through the Re Reforestation Trust Fund. Beyond federal lands, the BIL, or the, the infrastructure law, 
uh, also includes critical investments to enable an all lands landscape scale approach to wildfire preparedness. This multi-layered approach provides land management agencies with a generational opportunity uh, to demonstrate a paradigm shift away from commercial management and emergency suppression and towards fire adaptation and ecosystem services. In that regard, some of the primary implementation questions uh, for the Natural Resources Committee include evaluating the adequacy of these investments in the context of annual appropriations, uh, measuring success beyond board feet and acres treated, and assessing if additional investments, uh, workforce, policy changes uh, may be necessary. While I recognize uh, that there is genuine bipartisan interest in these issues, um, I, you know, be remiss if I didn't say it's unfortunate that my friends on the other side of the aisle uh, voted against this legislation that I've, I have described and all of the myriad benefits that I think it will have for forest management. Uh, but I hope uh, that they will join us in the efforts that are well underway to build on the success that we have uh, achieved as a result of that bipartisan infrastructure law, including expanding uh, compensation for wildland firefighter pay. Uh, I understand that we can expect some clarity on the wildland firefighter classification issue, uh, which I've touched on in prior hearings uh, in May from the administration. And I hope that we can continue to work together on TIMS Act, which is my legislation with uh, Republican Representative Liz Cheney that establishes a minimum wage for federal firefighters, provides incentives and benefits needed to support and retain an effective fire federal wildland firefighter workforce. Finally, I'd like to thank our witnesses from the administration for joining us in person today. Uh, I know there's a lot moving with the fiscal uh, year 2023 budget, implementation of the omnibus, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, so uh, no shortage of, of pressing issues for all of you uh, to uh, grapple with, and we very much appreciate you taking the time to visit with us today. Uh, as you know, these investments are of the utmost importance to the members of this committee on both sides of the aisle, and that uh, we all have a vested interest in transparent, effective, and efficient implementation of the law. So with that, I look forward to your testimony, and I will uh, yield back the remainder of my time and recognize Ranking Member Harrell uh, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, or, or, sorry, I just gave you a raise. I said, oh, thank Speaker. you. I appreciate the promotion. Thank, thank you, Mr. Right. Chairman. Today we meet to discuss the implementation of the wildfire ecosystem restoration provisions contained in the bipartisan infrastructure law. This marks the very first time that our committee will have a chance to meaningfully meaningfully weigh in on this effort, as the House was completely shut out of the regular order process in crafting this so-called bipartisan law. So while we welcome the opportunity to provide oversight, this hearing is at best a half a, late, a, half a year late. And frankly, the apparent lack of anger from my friends on the other side of the aisle of this dais, who were equally barred from offering meaningful input on an infrastructure package, is baffling. The items we are discussing today are of profound importance for our nation as a whole, and especially our Western states that have experienced historical devastation from our seemingly endless catastrophic wildfire crisis. My home state of New Mexico has had over 2,700 fires burn over half a million acres over the last five years. And in the last two years, we've had record-breaking wildfire seasons that have burned a collective 17 million acres nationwide. Our Western communities have grown painfully accustomed to deadly and destructive blazes wreaking havoc year after year. The wildfire and ecosystem restoration provisions that we are going to discuss today do little more than, than light money on fire by throwing millions of dollars at the wildfire crisis without pairing it with meaningful regulatory reform to ensure our lands are actually managed properly. Decades of consistent mismanagement have shown that it is not a lack of funding that has pre prevented us from properly tackling our wildfire crisis, but rather onerous regulations and endless litigation from activist environmentalist groups. For instance, while the Forest Service's overall budget has more than doubled since 2014, the amount of hazardous fuel treatments has remained frustratingly stagnant only addressing roughly 2% of their needs annually. I'm concerned that the recently announced 10-year st strategy to combat the wildfire crisis will fall short 
because not only are the tools not in place to implement this strategy, but the Forest Service is also relying on only five years of funding to execute a 10-year plan. This is especially concerning considering yesterday's release of the Department of Interior's wildfire strategy, which is only five years. If given the chance, committee Republicans would have offered real improvements to the infrastructure package to truly address the foundational obstacles that have continuously bogged down responsible management of our fire-prone fire forests. This includes the Resilient Federal Forest Act, which I am proudly co-sponsoring. I also introduced the Wildfire Prevention and Drought Mitigation Act, which was included in that package. That would protect drought-affected forest communities from catastrophic wildfire by streamlining the environmental review process for active forest management pro projects aimed at protecting watersheds, wildlife habitat, snowpack, and improving water quality. The Resilient Federal Forest Act also included streamlining based on fire sheds, which the new 10-year strategy is based on. These substantive pieces of legislation would unquestionably lead to better management of our force and better recovery from the devastation left in the wake of past wildfires. I do look forward to hearing from the administration today, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here. And while the so-called bipartisan infrastructure law undeniably falls short on truly unleashing the type of wildfire treatments and restoration work necessary to respond to this historic crisis, it is vital that we do everything we can to ensure that the increased funding is being used as wisely as possible. Ultimately, we must rise to the unprecedented threats facing our Western lands and any notion that the provisions contained in the infrastructure law fully address the enormity of these dangers must be rejected. As we speak, over 100 million acres of our federal lands remain at high risk for wildfire and over a billion acres are at risk nationwide. Even if the Forest Service can fully achieve the increased targets they have set, which is a big if, it would still not fully tackle the backlog of treatments needed on our federal lands. We simply must do better. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Westerman, for five minutes. I suspect we're going to hear about trillion trees, but I'm not sure. I'm going to wait and see. No trillion trees today. But thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what we need to do with the trees that we've got, not what uh, uh, before we talk about planting more of them, and we're doing a miserable job with the trees that we've got. But, Mr. Chairman, I want to first. Uh, express my gratitude that today's hearing is a hybrid format. Uh, it gives us a chance to meet in person to discuss a very important wildfire uh, crisis. And as you know, committee Republicans have consistently opposed the majority's decision to conduct committee business virtually. And we welcome this return to the hearing room. Good to see you in, in person and the other, other members around the dais. Um, Mr. Chairman, you, you rightly said that we need to take wildfire mitigation uh, and resiliency seriously. And I've been saying that since I first came to Congress. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think we've taken it seriously yet. And hopefully we can keep working on that and someday we will take it seriously and we'll see the results of it. I do want to echo Representative Harrell's concerns that the so-called bipartisan infrastructure law reflects yet another example of Congress just throwing money at a problem, trying to put a Band-Aid uh, on the symptoms instead of actually uh, getting to the root problem of the problem and, uh, and blocking the scientifically supported forest management that is so desperately needed. Uh, and, you know, with this, uh, with the wildfire and ecosystem restoration projects and this infrastructure package, it's sadly just the latest installment of increased funds to a system that's clearly broken. Uh, just four years ago, Congress delivered the fire funding fix, which gave the Forest Service and DOI $2.25 billion of new budget authority. We were promised that this was the primary obstacle to increasing the pace and scale of forest management, yet hazardous fuels treatments have remained stagnant. Like Representative Harrell mentioned, the Forest Service's budget has more than doubled, doubled in 10 years, and yet that still is not enough. Uh, maybe we should look at changing the name of the Forest Service to the Fire Service. Um, even the forest testimony today calls the $5.5 billion provided by the BIF a mere down payment on the actual funding that is needed. 
you know, if we were serious about wildfire mitigation and resiliency, and if the BILF was an attempt to fix that, you'd think we would have had at least one hearing in the House about the uh, bi so-called bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, the largest infrastructure spending in the history of the world, and, and not only did it not go through this committee, it didn't go through the Tr Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, and the truth is that even as the budgets have continued to climb for our land management agencies, we are not seeing the type of paradigm shift that we all know needs to happen if we are ever going to truly tackle this historic crisis. The primary culprits bogging down responsible manage management and recovery of our overgrown fire prone forest have been and remain onerous regulatory burdens and the continued weaponization of our courts by activist environmental groups that litigate even the smallest management project, Jax. I've said many times before, and I'll keep saying it over and over, that the forest and nature could care less what we say in this room. They could care less how much money the federal government sends to an agency. Uh, they just keep growing and the fires keep burning. And as long as we're talking and throwing money at it and not addressing the root problem, that's what they're going to do. Uh, we're to the point uh, that we've been for quite some time where we need a lot less talk or a little less talk and a lot more action. That's the only thing that's going to fix this wildfire crisis. Uh, Representative Harrell is correct in talking about the bills that we've uh, uh, introduced on the, on the Republican side, the Resilient Federal Forest Act and other bills that look at the real problems that our forest land managers face. Um, you know, with all this money, I'm waiting to see some action, but it's not going to happen with the environmentalists that come in and stop the projects until they quit suing, until we quit giving, quit giving them the ability to hold up the management. Uh, there's no amount of money and no number of staff that are going to be able to fix the problem with our forest. Um, if people want to truly understand how bad our catastrophic wildfire crisis has gotten, look no further than our giant sequoias. Over a 15 month period from 2020 to 2021, we lost nearly one fifth of the world's giant sequoias. Let me say that again. These iconic trees that are thousands of years old only grow in about 37,000 acres in California and we lost 20% of them in a short period of time. And these trees are the most fire resilient species probably on the planet. Their bark's two feet thick at the base. Um, the, they've, they used to get 31 fires per century, but we started putting the fires out and uh, they were only getting, they only had three fires in the 20th century. And now the fires get in the crowns and wipe them out. Uh, that is unacceptable. And if we don't act, we're gonna lose all of our giant sequoias. Now they'll grow back. We'll have little spindly giant sequoia seedlings growing out there. Uh, but these iconic trees, um, we've got to do something to fix that. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, appreciate your patience and let me go over a little bit and I yield back. Ranking, mem ranking member yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the distinguished chairman of the full committee, Mr. Carhalva, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Nagus and Ranking Member, for uh, 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 having me on the subcommittee today. And you know, I appreciate the Biden administration witnesses uh, joining us um, as you work to implement the, the the priorities of the bipartisan infrastructure law. That is uh, an important and historic investment, not only in the nation's infrastructure but in the natural world and and the systems most impacted. Uh, by climate change, and that's why I decided to vote for it. And uh, like any any member uh, that voted for it, you know, I didn't like everything in it. Uh, wasn't crazy about the process. Uh, and I know some uh, my some of my uh, colleagues had legitimate concerns about passing it while so much was still up in the air and off the table. Uh, but at the end of the day, I voted to support it. And I did so because it was uh, a tremendous benefit to my constituents. And of course, uh, with that, an acknowledgement that more has to be done. We know that. But uh, that's why this committee has spent considerable time and effort on a legislative and oversight agenda that may, maybe 
just maybe, will be enough to begin to address our climate, jobs, justice, and public land needs. Uh, that is why I also voted for the bipartisan infrastructure law when, it, when I had a chance. Unfortunately, not a single Republican on this committee can say the same, except, of course, for the late dean of the House from Alaska, Representative Don Young, who in all his wisdom recognized that it was an important historic vote and that it would benefit directly his people in Alaska. I expect we'll hear the usual complaints that the bedrock environmental laws or endangered species protections are the real problem or, or outside um, environmental extremists who are clogging up the courts day after day and not allowing anything to be done. Uh, but we'll also know that, uh, uh, but we also know what is really deeply needed, federal leadership in support of a long-term investments uh, working with states and other partners to make those investments uh, as fruitful as possible and to meaningfully address climate change, wildfire, and biodiversity. That's why that's uh, bipartisan infrastructure law does. It begins to, 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 and that's what the Protecting America's Wilderness Act does. And that's what, that's what we'll continue to do by any means that is available to us to promote that. Uh, without continued action on climate change, communities that rely on forests and public lands for their clean water, recreation, habit, wildlife habitats will continue to be at risk from climate impacts like drought in my state and wildfires in my state. Uh, the record of the Natural Resources Committee, I think, speaks for itself. The hearing today is about making sure the Department of Interior and the U.S. Forest Service are transparent, accountable, and guided by science in implementing what needs to be the historic down payment in our efforts to address climate change, wildfire, restoration, reforestation, and the very critical workforce needs. So um, again, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member, uh, thank you and the witnesses, and I look forward to their testimony. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to turn to our witness panel. Let me remind the witnesses that under committee rules, they must limit their oral statements to five minutes, but that their entire statement will appear in the hearing record. When you begin, the timer will begin. Uh, the lights in front of you will turn yellow when there is one minute left and then red when the time has expired. For any members and witnesses joining remotely, uh, it will turn orange when you have one minute remaining and I recommend that you pin the timer so it remains visible. After your testimony is complete, please remember to mute yourself on the microphone in front of you, and uh, we will also allow the entire panel to testify before uh, we proceed with questions. Uh, the chair will now recognize our first witness, Mr. Jeff Rupert, Director of the Office of Wildland Fire at the U.S. Department of the Interior. Mr. Rupert, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Nagus, Ranking Member Westerman, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to provide um, testimony on the Department of the Interior's investments in wildfire management, ecosystem restoration, and resilient communities. The investments made in the bipartisan infrastructure law provide an unprecedented opportunity to reduce the impacts of wildfire on ecosystems and communities, as well as modernizing our wildland fire workforce. We appreciate the subcommittee's commitment to these outcomes and look forward to our continued work together. Um, climate change continues to drive the devastating intersection of extreme heat, drought, and wildland fire danger across the United States, creating wildfires that move with a speed and intensity previously unseen. Climate change has created a continuous fire year for our nation, and American communities continue to bear the brunt of the resulting cycle of intensifying droughts, wildfires, and poor air quality. Funding provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law supports the department's efforts to mitigate the impacts of these changes on wildland fire and better safeguard people, communities, and resources. Current drought conditions and the drought outlook for much of the United States is very concerning. The NOAA Climate Prediction Center's seasonal drought outlook shows continued drought across nearly all of the West. And even in areas that have seen above normal rainfall this past winter, um, we may expect them to experience increased spring vegetation growth, 
and then fast moving wildfires during a dry, hot summer. The United States has over 1 billion burnable acres that are at some level of risk from wildfire. More than 250 million of those acres are at higher, very high wildfire hazard potential. And 7.1 million of those high, very high hazard acres are administered by Interior. Funding provided in the bipartisan infrastructure law allows the department to dramatically increase our efforts to reduce wildfire risk, improve community resiliency, and support post-fire recovery in these areas. The additional investment in ecosystem restoration amplifies this support with efforts to restore ecological health, providing millions for restoration projects and supporting national revegetation efforts, including implementation of the national seed strategy. Today, I'm happy to announce that yesterday, um, Interior released its five-year monitoring maintenance and treatment plan as required by um, the bipartisan infrastructure law. DOI's plan provides a roadmap for increasing the pace and scale of fuels management and rehabilitation of lands damaged by wildfires with a focus on fire-prone interior and tribal nation lands. It directly aligns with the USDA Forest Service 10-year wildfire crisis strategy and identifies needed investments in science, technology, and tools to inform and empower stakeholders to work collaboratively. Together, both blueprints facilitate a coordinated multi-jurisdictional approach to reducing wildfire risk over broad landscapes. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law funding also enables the department to accelerate plans initiated in FY21 to transform the firefighting workforce. Recent challenging seasons, fire seasons have focused attention on the increasing threat of wildfire to people, communities, and the natural environment. Yesterday's fire season is today's fire year, shifting the fire workforce towards a more permanent full-time um, appointment, supports career growth, increases the retention of more experienced and knowledgeable firefighters. In turn, this will have a substantial long-lasting effect in support of a more robust, sound management, decision-making, and safety for firefighters and the public. The department maintains strong relationships with states, tribal nations, other federal agencies, and local governments and stakeholders. Other f we remain committed to work in partnership to address wild and fire management issues and manage wildfire risk. Our work with elected officials, tribes, and organizations such as the Western Governors Association, National Association of Counties are key to implementing sound principles in wild and fire management before, during, and after wildfires. The bipartisan infrastructure law also authorizes establishment of the Wild and Fire Mitigation and Management Commission. Announced in December 2021, it will play a key role in recommending federal policies and strategies to more effectively prevent, mitigate, suppress, and manage wildfires, including the rehabilitation of burned areas. The commission is in the process of reviewing applications for membership from individuals with a broad spectrum of knowledge and interest to address wildfire impacts to our nation. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss these important investments in partnerships, ecosystem restoration, and the well-being of our wildland firefighters. This concludes my statement. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Rupert. The chair now recognizes Ms. Jalith Hall Rivera, the Deputy Chief of State and Private Forestry at the U.S. Department of Agriculture Forest Service. Uh, Ms. Hall Rivera, you have five minutes. Great, thank you so much. Chairman Nugus, Ranking Member Harrell, and members of this subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. I deeply appreciate Congress's passage of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or Bill, which provides a significant down payment on the work the Forest Service intends to accomplish under the 10-year strategy to confront the wildfire crisis. The agency recognizes that the American people depend on the nation's forests and grasslands for their social, economic, and personal well-being. All the benefits of the nation's forests that the nation's forests provide are at risk, as nearly a quarter of the contiguous United States is currently in high to moderate wildfire condition. Over the last two decades, we have witnessed what has become a now familiar pattern, bigger and more destructive wildfires that are extremely challenging and costly to suppress. We have experienced catastrophic fire seasons in the last two years alone, devastating communities and destroying resources in their wake. They threaten human health, water quality, homes, jobs, local economies, communities, and infrastructure. They also threaten key ecological values, including carbon storage, species habitat, 
soil stability, and watershed functions, in some cases even resulting in long-term deforestation. We are experiencing and are prepared for another long and arduous fire year in 2022. In fact, as we know, there's already significant fire activity occurring in the South, and we went nationally to preparedness level two last week. Much of the West remains in drought. The high level of hazardous fuels across the landscape and the expanding wildland urban interface indicate we will face an extremely challenging fire year. Our priority first and foremost is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of the fire management community and the public we serve. The bill supports the Forest Service's efforts to confront this crisis by investing in hazardous fuels reduction, fire risk mitigation across boundaries, technological advancements, and firefighter compensation. We are currently working on sending this money out to the field to begin work in high priority landscapes to reduce wildfire risk to communities and watersheds. The over billion dollars in funding targeted towards hazardous fuels reduction in section 40803 of the bill will allow us to begin implementing the 10-year wildfire crisis strategy. This funding also helps us to build new markets by providing financial assistance to facilities that purchase and process byproducts from ecosystem restoration projects from the $400 million that was authorized under section 40804 of the law. The Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program will provide us financial assistance using the billion dollars under section 40803F to be focused on at-risk communities to help them develop community wildfire protection plans and to implement those prevention and mitigation activities that are outlined in those plans. Hiring and retaining firefighters in increasingly long and complex fire years is a challenge that we all take seriously. Section 40803D of the bill calls for the classification of a new and unique wildland firefighter series, provides funding for short-term salary increases, provides the ability for us and the Department of the Interior to convert 1,000 seasonal firefighters into permanent fire managers, and provides us the ability to increase investments in programs that focus on mental health, resilience, and well-being. USDA, in collaboration with its partners at the Interior and the Office of Personnel Management, is working to implement these classification pay and staffing conversion provisions. The infrastructure law was a significant step in the right direction in terms of wildland firefighter compensation. And once again, I thank you for your work on that. But we need to continue to work together to find a permanent solution to increasing our wildland firefighters' pay and making other system changes that ensure that we can continue to support our firefighters and ensure that this is a career that others will pursue in the future. The infrastructure bill also made investments in wildfire detection through sensors, cameras, and satellite platforms. The Forest Service has strong partnerships with NOAA, NASA, and the Department of the Defense to continue using the best remote technology to detect and access wildfires on the landscape. Once again, I thank you for your investments and your interest in wildfire management, ecosystem restoration, and resilient communities. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hall Rivera. The chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Brian Farabee, Chief Executive of Intergovernmental Relations at the United States Department of Agriculture, Forest Service. Uh, Mr. Farabee, you have five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Nagus, Ranking Member Harrell, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to testify before you today. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, or Bill, is a critical first step in helping the Forest Service to confront the wildfire crisis. As outlined by Deputy Chief Hal Rivera, the benefits that American forests and grasslands provide are at risk from wildfire. Unless we do something about the wildfire crisis, it would only get worse. To protect communities and natural resources, we need to restore healthy, resilient, fire adaptive forests. It will take a paradigm shift to confront the wildfire crisis facing the nation. The old paradigm is to use our limited funds and capacity to scatter treatments randomly across the landscape to the best of our limited ability. The new paradigm is to step up the pace and scale of our treatments to match the actual scale of the wildfire crisis across the landscape while using science as an underpinning to assist in determining where we treat. We worked with scientists, tribes and state governments, and partner organizations to prepare the 10-year strategy and draft implementation plan for confronting the wildfire crisis while also working with DOI on their five-year strategic plan. While we sustain current treatment levels in the South, Midwest, and Northeast, 
we plan to dramatically increase fuels and forest health treatments by up to four times the current treatment levels in the West, where the wildfire risks to homes and communities are the highest. Less than 10% of our fire-prone forests in the West account for roughly 80% of the fire risk to communities. While we'll focus on high-risk fire sheds, where the risk to lives, homes, communities, and natural resources are the greatest, we will work with partners to treat an additional 20 million acres on national forest system lands and 30 million acres on other federal, state, and tribal private lands. In order to implement this nationwide strategy, we are building a workforce capacity in the Forest Service to match the scale of the work. To achieve the collective impact that our forests and communities need, we must build a coalition to work across land management jurisdictions, leverage diverse capacity, and build broad public and community support to work at the scale necessary to make a difference. This includes work across federal, state, local, and private lands, and with non-governmental organizations. The bill supports the Forest Service efforts to confront this crisis by investing in hazardous fuel reduction, fire risk mitigation across boundaries, and post-fire restoration. The agency is working closely with the regions to identify projects within high-risk fire shed landscapes designed to reduce wildfire risk to communities and watersheds. The funding of these projects using the over $1 billion authorized under the section 40803 in the bill will allow us to begin implementing the 10-year wildfire crisis strategy the Replant Act under Section 70301-70303 of the bill gives us an historic opportunity to address reforestation backlog needs with wildfires and other disturbances. This provision removes the cap from reforestation trust funds, giving us more resources for post-fire restoration. This will enable us to ramp up the reforestation treatments to almost a half a million acres a year including 200,000 acres of planting, a more than 300% uh, increase. The bill provides $100 million under Section 40803 and $45 million under Division J for restoration activities that are implemented no later than three years after the date of wildfires is contained. These funds are being focused to repair and replace minor infrastructure and facility damaged by fires and on the repair or improvement of lands that are unlikely to recover naturally to the management approved conditions. The bill makes important investments in cross-boundary tools such as Good Neighbor Authority by providing $160 million in section 40804 to provide funds to states and tribes for implementing restoration projects on federal lands and by codifying the Joint Chief Landscape Restoration Partnership Program in section 40808. So in closing, we greatly appreciate the significant down payment Congress has provided through the bill that will allow us, the Forest Service, with many of our partners to take the initial steps to address the wildfire crisis. This work will result in resilient landscapes that have ecological integrity, provide essential ecosystem services, including carbon storage and habitat for wildlife, and balanced opportunities for American citizens to recreate. The Forest Service looks forward to working with you in the subcommittee to reduce the severity of wildfire in our country. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Uh, the uh, chair will now, or but rather the hearing, will proceed with member questions. And we will start with uh, the gentleman from New York, Mr. Tonko. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Chairman Nagoose and Ranking Member Harold for holding this hearing and to our witnesses for taking meaningful action to combat wildfires and the climate crisis that fuels them so that communities across our great nation may continue to access clean water, recreation, and certainly wildlife ecosystems for generations. I'm indeed proud to represent the capital region of New York, where many in our community care deeply about our nation's public lands and forests, whether they be at home in New York or across the nation. The bipartisan infrastructure law focused on the western forests facing the greatest wildlife risks, but nationally, 20% of the nation's freshwater flows from these Forest Service managed lands. So Mr. Farabee, as you mentioned in your testimony, more than 60 million people living in 3,400 communities across some 36 states depend on our national forests and grasslands for their drinking water. It is so critical that we implement science-based holistic restoration strategies to combat the wildfire crisis and protect these vital forests for the benefit of communities everywhere. 
among the uh, bipartisan infrastructure laws investments was a $100 million annual increase to the Reforestation Trust Fund. Wildfire funding included for uh, burned area recovery and restoration programs and significant funding for DOI and USFS ecosystem restoration and remediation programs. So Mr. Farabee, how will the Forest Service leverage these investments to ensure reforestation and restoration are based on science while accounting for climate change, biodiversity loss, and ecosystem services? Thank you for the question, Congressman. So as we uh, move out on this work, it's critically important that we acknowledge all of our work aligned with the provisions, the intent and the provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure law. And to that point, we are looking at opportunities when we go into project selection to really look at several factors in addition to meeting the intent of the legislation itself. So to your, to your question and point, for instance, around watersheds and watershed health and the critical nature of them. When it comes to, for instance, legacy roads and trails program, we are looking at um, we are looking at criteria such as do projects that we receive um, meet the intent of NEPA? Are they compliant? Do they are they aligned and are they in critical watersheds that are important uh, to our nature? Uh, do they help us actually connect upstream habitat uh, for wildlife um, from a reconnection perspective? Do they address some of the challenges we have when it comes to uh, small culverts in place that have caused us uh, degradation problems? There'll be a number of those kinds of criteria that we will establish to make sure that we're receiving the kind of outcomes that we want to on the landscape as well as outputs. In respect to your question about tracking, we are working closely internally to not only look at how we might allocate these funds in the right place, but also having the appropriate mechanisms in place to really track and be transparent around these funds for the American public. And then how will these investments help build the uh, reforestation pipeline, including efforts to address reforestation needs in eastern forests and urban areas with poor tree equity? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, again, Congressman. With respect to reforestation, the Replant Act provision in the legislation really provides us an opportunity from a resource standpoint to do a number of things. One, our agency has developed a strategy to really address the backlog that we're experiencing with reforestation. And in that light, we are looking at being able to treat up to a half a million acres a year with 200,000 of that being uh, reforestation of planting. Alongside of that, as a part of our strategy, we're really looking at how we can grow capacity within our nurseries themselves um, to have more stock available for reforestation. And, and lastly, to actually increase our capacity, we are also looking at the opportunity to partner and collaborate more closely with states and tribal governments. And lastly, Mr. Farabee, the Forest Service has many existing science-based tools, such as the Watershed Condition Framework, to help identify res restoration needs. Beyond the wildfire funding, how is the Forest Service using these tools and other data to identify priority restoration needs utilizing BIL investments? Um, thank you for your question, Congressman. Uh, to your point, we have a number of tools, such as the, wild, the Watershed Condition Class Framework. We have also our National Cohesive Strategy. We have shared steward agreements. Um, as I mentioned in my testimony, we also have tools like Good Neighbor Authority. And the agency is looking at using every tool that we have made available to us by Congress to really show up in this space, to really change the trajectory of wildfire, and at the same time to make sure that the work that we do is sound ecologically. Thank you so much. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back and thank you for your courtesy. Of course, gentlemen yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Ranking Member Harrell for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for the testimony. Um, I have a question for uh, Ms. Hall Rivera. So the BIL authorized a new categorical exclusion for fuel breaks and included a new authority for emergency actions, uh, which would allow for fire prevention work to go forward more quickly. So my question is, why did the 10-year strategy that you published in January include no references to how these authorities will be implemented? Thank you for that question, Congressman, and uh, we uh, deeply appreciate uh, the new tools that are provided to us in the bill. And um, I would say, frankly, it was probably just a bit of a timing issue. You know, uh, we were in development with the strategy uh, during the time frame that uh, 
the infrastructure law was being considered because we knew that we needed to be prepared for this crisis, you know, either way. We needed a, we need a plan. Um, but I will say uh, these tools are important to us and we are already using them. In fact, I was made aware yesterday there are five projects that are already using this new fuel break CE. So it's a tool in our toolbox and we are using it. Great, thank you. And um, the bill authorized the establishment of a commission to study and provide recommendations to Congress focused on wildland fire management, including issues related to aerial wildland firefighting equipment, USDA, DOI, and the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Emergency Management Agency um, announced that the establishment of the commission would be December 2021. But my question is um, to you, can, uh, when can we expect the members to be appointed to this commission, and how will this commission differ from existing agencies such as the Wildland Fire Leadership Council or the White House Wildland um, or Wildfire Resilience uh, Interagency Working Group? I mean, how will it differ? Sure, I'll um, try to answer that as best I can. Um, so the, the nomination process for the commission closed last Friday, and uh, I understand we had a very large uh, amount of interest, over 500 applications. So uh, we, Interior, FEMA, are in the process now of evaluating those. I would expect us to have a, a list of members that, you know, there's a number of categories in the bill that you're probably aware of that make up the commission, so I would think maybe about a month or or two that we would be able to name that and then have the commission get started. And you rightly point out we have many other interagency groups that work in this space. Wildland fire uh, and uh, forest restoration is a complex, interjurisdictional, you know, multi-governmental issue. And so, um, at least I think from our perspective, the more voices that we can get uh, to weigh in on this the better, and what the commission does that's a little different than the other ones that you named is that it's really broad, and there's a number of non-federal uh, entities that will be a part of it that are not present on the other commissions, even on WIFLIC, which does have non-federal membership. So, um, like I said, more voices, um, more and more people and more and more citizens are being impacted by this problem, and, and I think that the nature of the makeup of the commission recognizes that. Okay, and, and last, um, uh, we've heard that the Forest Service's use of an existing categorical exclusion for removing hazardous, uh, hazard trees along roads after wildfires being, ch if, well, let me try that again, uh, removing hazard trees along roads after wildfires has been challenged in court. So my question is, are you safely uh, able to reopen roads in places like Oregon, California, or does Congress need to clarify that, that you have the authority to do so? Um, we just want to make sure that with the tools, you've got the authority to do some of these. Um, well, thank you for that projects. question, Congresswoman. Uh, I know we are uh, implementing a numerous hazard tree projects throughout the West, uh, and we are using um, a fair amount of the funding that came from the disaster supplemental to do that, and so we're very appreciative of that. Uh, certainly, we are. We probably do have litigation on some of those projects, and I don't have those details in front of me. And be happy to get back with you on that, and, and work with you if we are seeing some spaces where we might need a little bit of clarification or assistance. So thank you for that. Okay. And just a final question for all three: Have all of you been out and toured our national forests? I mean, been to New Mexico, California, Oregon, and seen the burn scars or the fire? The what our forests look like in terms of. Um, the fuel on the ground. I mean, I live in the middle of the Lincoln National Forest. Have, have you been out there, boots on the ground, to see it for yourselves, what we're dealing with? Uh, yes, uh, we I certainly have, and uh, turn to my colleagues. Sir? Yeah, we were we were actually out on a, on a trip together just, just a week ago, um, looking at, at um, fuels reduction work and, and impacts. And I do want to real briefly apologize. I misspoke during my okay. uh, during my opening statement, um, and I'm guilty of just reading and not thinking. No apology. I heard it, but it's no apology. <laughs> I'll answer to anything. You're fine. Yes, as well as my colleagues mentioned, I have had the um, fortunes or unfortunes to be able to go out and look at some of both the great work that's going on, but also some of the impacts from areas we have not been able to get to scale at this point to address the issue that we're here to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. I certainly would concur with uh, the ranking member and encourage uh, all of you and, and your staffs within the various departments to come to Colorado and to New Mexico, to the Western states and see the burn scars for yourself. Clearly, you all have, but I would encourage your teams to do so as well. Um, the chair will now recognize for five minutes a gentlewoman from New Mexico, Ms. Ledger Fernandez. 
Thank you much, very much, Chair Nagus, and thank you very much for holding this hearing and for having these witnesses testify uh, about the important work that's been done. You know, wildfires have been a reality in New Mexico for centuries, for uh, millennial, but we know that climate change and drought are making wildfires worse and that we must address that. You know, my brothers, friends, neighbors are or have been wildland firefighters. Tribes and villages in my district send hot shot crews to battle these life-threatening blazes and have indigenous ecological knowledge that the infrastructure bill is actually going to help fund to utilize that. Um, uh, and I really appreciate the partnerships that we're doing with the Intertribal Timber Council. Thank you for that. I think we need to remember that our local wildland fighters see their work as not just a job, but as a way of protecting the watersheds that our communities depend on for our water, uh, to quench our thirsts and grow our crops, and as noted, for us to be able to go out and enjoy that nature. So it is, it, it, the, I think we have to recognize how deep, how deep the commitment is um, that our wildland fighters have, and we must provide them with the support that we can. You know, my vote in support of the bipartisan infrastructure law was a recognition of this huge need. It was a recognition that we had to invest in New Mexico and in this region in the reduction of hazardous fuels and community resilience, ecosystem restoration more. So my community needs these resources and I'm glad that Congress responded. Um, I also wanna give a shout out in my district, uh, um, we have at New Mexico Forest and Watershed Restoration Institute at Highlands University, which is located in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Uh, we wanna continue to rely on conducting that research and then putting it into the field. I recently visited the Carson National Forest where they're using the Collaborative Forest Restoration Program to work with the Cerro Negro Forestry Council and that hires local leñeros, woodcutters, uh, to help th thin certain areas. It's one of those instances where we're gonna have great symbiotic relationship between community-led forestry, locals are getting in the business, shall we say, rather than bringing in big hot crews from elsewhere, right? It's, it's a way of developing uh, a local industry as well. Um, Deputy Chief Hal Rivera, uh, as the Forest Service is rolling out these investments from the infrastructure law, how can we make sure we continue to incentivize using local re resources and leveraging traditional practices? Thank you very much for that uh, question, Congresswoman. And I think there's a number of ways that we can look at that with, with this uh, historic investment that we're gonna be doing. And, and you've named a couple of them. Incorporating traditional ecological knowledge is gonna be critical. And um, you know we're improving our acumen in that area. I'm not gonna say that we uh, have always been perfect at that, but what we need to do is learn together with our tribal sovereign partners and how we can better incorporate their knowledge they have. They have been fire stewards for millennia in this country. And um, so we are working to be able to incorporate that into our project plans, into our fire plans, to learn from one another as we co-develop these projects. And, um, a great opportunity that Bill gives us is that it names a dollar amount that we can use for the Tribal Forest Protection Act, which is really not something that's happened before. That's a tool that we've had, but having funding associated with it makes it a higher level of focus for us and ability for us to get those funds and use those projects where we work together with tribes, where uh, national forest system lands and tribal lands are near one another and we can co-prioritize those projects. So those are a couple places I, I would name, but we are working through roundtables to listen to and work with all kinds of stakeholders at the state and local level in every region of the country, and those are ongoing now. Thank you very much, and I would also point out that you have that $200 million that's available to enter into contracts or employ labor crews. I really wanna emphasize the importance of trying to do it locally. Um, Mr. Uh, Furby, do you, we only have a little bit of time left, but do you wanna uh, add anything to that? Well, I, just will, I will say, and I appreciate your emphasis um, on, on tribes and tribal contributions. Um, um, in recent weeks, we've um, uh, uh, engaged in tribal consultation around um, infrastructure and um, received lots of uh, 
feedback um, from many tribes identifying um, the needs, the support needs that they have as we, um, as we move forward with implementing bill. Um, within um, the department's existing programs, there are several um, programs focused on tribal support, um, reserve treaty land rights program. Um, we have a contract support program um, to, that, that we're also focusing on as we implement bill, looking at really efficiently and effectively um, um, moving that support um, to tribes. And, um, you know, I'm very much looking my, forward to My time is up, so uh, uh, thank you very much. And also, but looking at tribes, I want to also look at local communities like the Leniero program. Thank you very much. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Harrell for having this hearing. Thank you to the witnesses. And, uh, you know, sometimes it might seem like we're negative about the agencies, but I've traveled across the country and the people that work out in the field that want to do the right thing, it's got to be more frustrating to them than it is uh, to me to see how uh, ineffective we are at, at managing our federal lands you know, next or at the end of this week, we're having the Western Caucus visit uh, my home of Hot Springs, Arkansas, and I'm excited to take them out on the Washita National Forest and show them how forest management's actually happening on the National Forest and how resilient those forests can be. And, you know, looking at management across the country, the vast amount of the management done and the expenditures happens in the southeast and the north. You know, definitely east of the 100th meridian. The wildfires happen mostly west of the 100th meridian. Uh, can anybody explain to me why the management is vastly happening in the southeast and north and the fires are mainly happening in the west? Well, Mr. Rosterman, I'll, I'll take a crack at that and then turn it over to my colleagues uh, as well. Um, you know, I would say part of our aim with the Forest Service's 10-year strategy is to take the model that we have in the southeast, which is managed forests with, that are closer to their natural fire regime because they also have fire. As you know, the southeast is a leader in prescribed fire, and we'd like to take that model and take it into the west and be able to have but our forests. Do, force do in they the just West. burn in the south or do they do mechanical thinning before they burn? Yes, sir, they do both. <laughs> so, is there a danger of doing prescribed fire without mechanical thinning first? I would say in most cases, especially in the West, we need to do mechanical treatment before we introduce fire. How much mechanical treatment happens in the West? In the Forest Service, um, I a little over a million acres a year in the West. Of mechanical treatment? Mm -hmm. How much needs to happen? Well, gosh, we think at least 20 million more acres over the next 10 years, and most of that is in the West. So what's the biggest impediment to that? Well, you know, I think there, there's a lot, a lot of challenges, right? Funding, which the bill helps us with, capacity, uh, which we are building towards, not only capacity in the Forest Service, but as you know, finding What about things. outside litigants? Does that stop any of it? We do have challenges with litigation, yes, sir. And you can't fix that, only Congress can fix that. We are always happy to work with you, Congressman, All right. any tools. We, we need to fix that, and we, we haven't. So I'll just go down the, the panel. Uh, the wildfire crisis, is it caused mostly by lack of management or by climate change? Mr. Farabee. Thank you for the question, Congressman. I would say that we, we've acknowledged that there are a number of factors, those two being a part of it. So which one's the greatest? I'm not sure if we've, as an agency, decided which one is the greater. We've just acknowledged that there are a number of factors that affect, you know, our ability and how we're showing up currently. Ms. Hall Rivera? Yes, I would concur with that. They're, uh, they're all interwoven. They're not mutually exclusive. Mr. Rupert? Um, agree, we agree. Several factors. Um, I think in, uh, as interior is clearly... Um, um, identifying that climate change is the leading impact um, with uh, the, intensity. And the, the actions tend to show that we believe it's more climate change. So doesn't that logically make the reason that instead of spending money on the agencies, we should take all the money we're putting out there to the agencies and invest that in something to mitigate climate change since 
the management side is not really happening. Uh, aren't you making an argument to, to dissolve your very agencies and spend that taxpayer money somewhere else? No, I don't think so. In fact, I see, um, you know, our initial work to implement with Bill, it really is that um, important step. Um, we've been talking about the need to increase support and increase capacity. Um, so if you don't get on the ground, if, if we come back in a year or two years and there's not any results to show for the money that's being spent, does that not make the argument to the American public that it's an ineffective expenditure of their tax dollars that's not accomplishing or addressing the real problem? I think you'll see increased activity on the ground and accomplishments on the ground in year one and year two. And I think year three and beyond is where you'll start to see the real transformative change. I know changes. part of the plan that was put out projected year six through 10, um, but we definitely need to see some uh, some progress like last year. We're way behind the eight ball. So uh, my hope would be that we see dramatic improvements and a dramatic amount of uh, acreage that's being uh, treated and not just all in the southeast. If you look at the numbers in the west where most of the fires are happening, it's almost laughable to think that we're, um, we're claiming a small amount of treatments and then the treatments aren't really happening where the fires are. I'm out of time, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the chair of the full committee, Mr. Grijalva, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Rupert, just a, a general question. As, as you were giving your testimony about how important cross-agency, cross-jurisdictional cooperation and joint planning are going to be, uh, in the mission, uh, one of the one of the areas in which um, I don't think there's a lot of discussion, or, or needs to be some discussion, or has to de deal with the the jurisdiction prerogatives uh, that exist, cities and towns and counties, um, to basically uh, do their own land use planning, and so. And high growth regions are also happen to be high drought and wildfire impacted regions. Uh, I know that's the case in Arizona and, and in other parts of the country. And so my question is, how do you see bridging that? Uh, beginning with the question about people dealing with the same information. Because, you know, the relationship between a watershed protection, a restoration, and, and the interface, I don't know if that's always a factor. And coming from, uh, uh, as from former county supervisor, it was not, it wasn't in the, in, in the range. Well, I think, um, so I'll just start with the, the, as you described the importance of local community engagement, I think, you know, and even, even thinking about the Southeast and what's different in the Southeast than perhaps some other parts of the country, um, you know, that, that, that focused um, um, work that's going on in the Southeast also includes very active collaborative local level engagement. That's a fundamentally important part of what happens there to allow everything else to have. And I think as we talk about you know, tensions and, and conflicts around land use planning and about risk reduction activities, um, in my mind, perhaps one of the most important steps we can take, if not the most important, is to have local community members, local unit managers, federal, state, tribal, all those other stakeholders in the same room at the same table talking about shared values and coming up with collaborative risk reduction strategies. I think that's the, yeah, that's I, the key. In the I, I think, and particularly in the Forest Service, that, that strengthening that role of, of having the Forest Service play the, the, the necessary role of the honest arbitrator in those kind of discussions is critical, you know, and 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 how you build capacity in order to be able to do that, as opposed to just getting kind of carried along with the winds, because your comment is required in that process, and uh, and 
at least my experience, sometimes yes, sometimes no, depending. Uh, the participation by the Forest Service and by public land agencies was uh, either, the consistency wasn't there on the science and on the impact and everything. So it's just my, not even a suggestion. I think it's, it becomes more and more critical for, for the agencies to play that honest arbiter in those land use kind discussions that happen at the local level, you know? And with that, I yield back. Thank you. Chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes Mr. Tiffany for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much for the time. Um, uh, Mr. Rupert, you used the term collaborative. Uh, aren't the federal agencies supposed to coordinate with local units of government? Yes, absolutely. And I think from my perspective, that's one of the, the um, exciting aspects of, of, of infrastructure is it provides the support for us to you know, have more capacity in that direction and also to develop those relationships to provide the community Mr. support for that to happen. Mr. Chairman, I would just say to you that this is a very important distinction in terms, collaborate versus coordinate. They mean two very different things. And I think the agency people know that. Coordinate is treating people as equals at the table, local, state officials, that they be treated as equals when you're uh, making that decision rather than where it's the all-knowing people up here in the federal government that are dictating to local units of government. That's a great frustration local and state officials have. Uh, Mr. Rupert, um, you emphasize climate change in your testimony, I believe, and then also in your questioning with uh, Representative Westerman. Um, so with us being told that it's gonna be decades in the future that this is gonna continue, why would we spend all kinds of money on this um, if it's not gonna do anything to fix the problem or fix the quote unquote problem? Well, clearly the vision and the strategy is to make progress um, and to start on that progress. And you know, the, 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 the very real um, experience that you know, we see in um, you know, interior wildland fire programs across the land, man, I mean, the, the, those effects and that consequence are very real, this trajectory that we're on with impacts, catastrophic, intense wildfire. And, um, and we have that and, very and you real know that that's and you know that's due to climate change. I know that the impacts on the ground that we're experiencing are very real. So let me enter into the record here, if I may. Here's the Forest Service timber harvested uh, data from the early 1900s to 2014. Very easy to see the peak that we had back in about 1990. Without and objection. It's, and it's if I may enter that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, what if it's as a result of lack of harvest, the lack of management? The point um, our ranking member has been making consistently that it's a lack of management that is causing this problem more than anything else. Um, I think this is a terrific document that we should all look at very closely because maybe that is where our problem is. I would just also add, living uh, near Lake Superior, we were told, and I see extensive weather data due to a job I had previously coming to here, and uh, from 2004 to 2011, uh, Lake Superior was at a very low level, historic low levels, and we were told it was climate change. Well, Lake Superior now is back at historic high levels as a result of the extreme precipitation, or high precipitation we've had in the last 10 years, and we're being told it's climate change that is causing that. And for a lot of people, you just go, um, is there anything that climate change can't, change can't do? Um, Ms. Hall Rivera, um, you, I think you used the term historic investment in your testimony. I think it said significant down payment. So you're going to come back looking for more money. Is that right? Well, Congressman, uh, thank you for that question. You know, um, I think we have to be realistic about what this problem is costing us as a nation, and you made an important point. We have to do increased management, and we need to use all the tools for doing that, and that includes timber harvest, and that includes hazardous fuels treatment, and um, these are not inexpensive um, endeavors. You know, it's expensive to treat fuels. It's expensive how, how to many, do that work. How many jobs have we lost since 1988 as a result of the lack of harvest on the national forest? Well, I don't have that figure in, in front of me, Congressman, but I can tell you that uh, we've shifted um, probably we've lost 40% of our non-fire workforce in the Forest Service. And so we are having that challenge just within the Forest Service. We've lost a lot of our 
capacity and our expertise in uh, timber harvest. When are we going to reach the ASQ? Well, I, I know we do meet uh, allowable sale quantities on some of our forests, but we don't meet it on all of them. So we have more work to do. Um, how are we going to accomplish this without litigation reform? Well, you know what, uh, we are appreciative of the reforms that we have received, in, including the, the fuel break CE that we talked about earlier. Um, and, you know, we're open to working with all of you on additional tools that can help us increase our fuels treatment. Appreciate your answers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I just submit to you, um, we've got a huge litigation problem here. Um, I understand that there's um, multi-million dollar organizations across the country that do nothing but file lawsuits, and uh, they've created a real problem. And a lot of that problem you see right in this chart that we entered into the record. And, um, but I think we should also look at the number of jobs that we've lost, the number of businesses that we've lost um, in America, especially in the West, as a result of shutting down harvest on our national forests. We will not correct the problem that we have here without having active management and getting litigation reform. If we don't reform NEPA, um, it is not going to happen. We will be here 10 years from now talking about the same thing. Thank you so much for attending today, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. The chair will now uh, recognize himself for five minutes of questions. First, let me say to my colleagues on both sides of the aisle uh, that attended today's hearing, I very much appreciate it. Clearly, there's a strong interest uh, from members uh, regarding these issues uh, to Mr. Tiffany, to uh, Ms. Harrell, and to Mr. Westerman, as well as to my Democratic colleagues, I would say thank you for participating in today's hearing. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't note that for the better part of the last two years since I uh, obtained the gavel, uh, the chair of this subcommittee, I've heard quite a few of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, talk about the need for forest management and hearings on forest management. And lo and behold, we have a hearing on this important topic. Unfortunately, many of them chose not to attend. But I credit uh, those who did participate, and I appreciate uh, their questioning of the witnesses today. Um, I'd like to just take a step back and, and kind of reframe where we are, because I think some of this has, has kind of gotten lost during the course of today's hearing. My objective is to follow the science, right? The science tells us uh, that we need to do more when it comes to forest management. And that's an argument that uh, colleagues of mine on both sides of the aisle have, have made. The science also tells us that the root causes in terms of the intensity and the severity, the pervasiveness, the frequency of these natural disasters that have befallen much of our country, and in particular the Rocky Mountain West with respect to wildfires and floods, is caused by climate change. And so we ought to take steps to do what we can to mitigate and, and fight against uh, the climate crisis. Those are not mutually exclusive. I, I don't, I'm not really, uh, I guess I'm unclear as to why they are being framed as some sort of binary choice we can and we must do both, and that's precisely why we're gathered here today for this important hearing, and in particular today, we are talking about the former, uh, because as our witnesses have expounded upon, about in great detail today, uh, because of the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have a unique generational opportunity to invest in forest management in a way that we haven't uh, in some time. Uh, this bill ultimately allocates $28 billion, which the departments have now announced they will utilize uh, by treating upwards of 50 million acres, 20 million acres with respect to the, uh, that's within the jurisdiction of the federal government and then through a variety of different grant programs enabling the treatment of 30 million acres on private and tribal land in coordination, as Mr. Tiffany uh, noted. That should be applauded. That is, that is something... Uh, that is a unique achievement of the Biden administration. And I, I just, again, have to uh, say that for my friends on the other side of the aisle who continually, you know, kind of pound the table about the need to take these steps and then vote against the same measures that propose to take that st those steps, it can be a bit confusing to me. But nonetheless, uh, I am grateful that the department is taking the steps uh, that it has, uh, rather that they have announced in states ranging from Colorado to Idaho to Utah to Nevada to Wyoming to New Mexico, irrespective of how the members of Congress who represent those states voted on the ultimate law and the funding that you all now will be implementing. So I thank you for your service, and I certainly thank uh, your respective teams 
uh, back at headquarters and in, in uh, states across our country who are doing incredibly important work. I have one question, and it relates to the, the private land and the, the grant programs that will be uh, set up under uh, this particular piece of legislation. And I'm interested in hearing a bit more about how you anticipate the community wildfire defense grants being deployed within our communities. Um, you know, I, this money has to get to our communities. Uh, it, you know, in my view, should have gotten to our communities long ago. And as I said, I, I come from a district in a state that has been besieged by wildfires as of late. And I guess I, I'd like to get some clarity and some representations from you all that you have the resources that you need from a staffing perspective to deploy these dollars as quickly as possible uh, to communities in the Rocky Mountain West and of course across the country uh, that are in desperate need of those resources. And uh, I'm happy to let e any of the witnesses respond. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll start. Uh, yes, the um, Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program, a billion dollars between both provisions is uh, absolutely historic investment uh, in community wildfire protection plans and the projects that are named within them. And, and we have a spotlight on getting this uh, grant program up and running. So we're working, uh, the Department of the Interior, Forest Service, and the National Association of State Foresters are working hand in hand to develop the guidelines and get um, the program out. Uh, we anticipate those guidelines being ready by May. We hope to have the funding opportunity announced in June and uh, get some of the first grants out by September. So that, you know, less than a year to put together a brand new program at that level, um, I think is really, uh, really um, important. The other thing that we're doing is we're contemplating what I would call kind of a base capacity level funding for each state so that they do have the resources to be able to carry out the program. So I'd turn to my colleague, Mr. Rupert, to add anything. Well, I'll just add that Interior very much appreciates the work of the Forest Service. Um, that community defense grant support is directed at the Forest Service and um, we appreciate the collaboration and the leadership um, that, that they're providing um, for that work and, and including us as well, thank you. Well, thank you both and I would just simply say we look forward to working with you uh, and seeing uh, the fruits of your labor materialize here, certainly in my communities and community co communities across the country. And I would, not to belabor the point, uh, but I do think Mr. Tiffany raises a good point that, it, it, that these programs have to be in coordination uh, with our local communities. And so I, I, I suspect that that's of heavy emphasis for each of your agencies, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, with that, we will, uh, the chair will now recognize Mr. Gallego from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Thank you to your witnesses for your time today. As you all know, wildfire is an issue that is always top of mind in Arizona. In the first three months of 2022, there have already been around 90 fires in the state. Dry conditions indicate that the 2022 fire season will start earlier than normal. Large parts of the state face abnormally dry drought conditions, and fine fuels are anticipated to be above average. With all these issues, it is vital that we be prepared to manage fires and increase resilience. I'm hopeful that funding from the bipartisan infrastructure law will help make that happen. My first question is for Deputy Chief Paul Rivera. The bipartisan infrastructure law directed 20 million to the Southwest Ecological Restoration Institute to create and maintain a national fuel treatment database and to publish a report every five years. What is the Forest Service's strategy for ensuring that data is, is entered consistently and reflects Congress's investments in our federal lands? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, we actually just had a meeting with the uh, institutes last week and um, are exciting, excited to uh, get into this partnership together. Of course, we work very closely with the Swearies already, but this is an added investment and a focus on something that um, the New Mexico uh, University piloted and then now we're gonna be able to expand to the rest of the country. So we're gonna be working with them very closely, primarily our research branch and they'll be co-developing how we're gonna expand that project. And then um, we'll work together with our regions to ensure that we have the right kind of data and the data standards to ensure that that can be successful across the country. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for Mr. Ferby. Uh, Department of Interior's wildlife, wildfire spend plan identifies several different criteria to inform fuels work and prioritize BIL funding, including the retention of large trees and fire resilience stands and limits on permanent and temporary road construction. How will USFS projects ensure the protection and conservation of wilderness and roadless areas? Thank you for the question, Congressman. So 
as, as stated in our strategy, our strategy focuses on um, community exposure. And so we are in that footprint in close proximity to, to those areas, and which is what we consider our managed lands, which is not in our roadless areas and our wilderness areas. So by the, by the way our strategy is aligned and how we are looking to focus, we're not looking to focus in those areas when it comes to mitigation of exposure to our communities. In addition to that, what I would say is our intent is to meet the provisions of, uh, in the intent of all the provisions in the legislation. And all of our projects are designed with an e ecological frame in mind while they may also be trying to achieve other outcomes. And so very much committed to meeting the intent of other laws like the Wilderness Act and our requirements uh, um, when it comes to managing roadless areas. Thank you. My final question can be answered by either Forest Service uh, witness. With $4.5 billion of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act directed towards wildfire and forest provisions, significant new funding and important programs are expected to be implemented by the Forest Service. Does the Forest Service have adequate staff capacity to fulfill the new dollars they will be responsible with implementing? And how does the Forest Service plan to address staffing capacities with new hiring? Uh, thank you. So as a part of um, our strategy, we're working with our field to really identify what we think are the skill sets that are needed in order to deliver on this work. What I would also like to just highlight, though, is as we've talked about in this community already, is this is an all lands issue. And so while we are as an agency working on our capacity needs, we are also having conversations with our federal partners, our state partners, tribes, and, and NGOs in this same space, because if we are gonna address this issue and address it, and address it at scale from an all lands perspective, it's gonna require all of us to have the capacity that we need. And to the degree that we don't have it, working closely together in collaborative, in a kind of collaborative form, really helps us leverage our collective resources as well. So the agency has very much developed a strategy to to look at hiring our needs, but at the same time, looking at how we show up with the rest of our partners in this all lands issue. Ms. Rivera? Ms. Rivera, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add, sir. Okay. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Moore, for five Thank minutes. Thank you, chair, ranking member. Thank, thank you all for joining us today. We are rapidly approaching another wildfire season. Like last year and the year before, in the year before, we've done little to nothing to fundamentally improve the way we manage our lands to prevent catastrophic wildfires. One key fundamental point, Utahns feel this every day in the summer as we inhale smoke from California and Oregon. Um, it's as of the root of what I'm really trying to do here and trying to improve this. I introduced the Fire Sheds Act and co-sponsored Ranking Member Westerman's Resilient Federal Forest Act to fundamentally improve the way our lands are managed. We can prevent these out of control fires that threaten our communities. We can prevent them. Why do you think it is, for Mr. Rupert, why do you think it is important to enhance shared stewardship agreements, adopt fire shed research and mapping, and extend the good neighbor authority in our fight against fire? Well, the, there's been reference to tools in the toolbox over the course of the day, and certainly, you know, good neighbor authority, shared stewardship, um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, improved data standards and using technology um, to inform decision making pre fire, during fire, post fire. You know, all of those are, are important tools um, to, you know, ultimately um, um, changing the trajectory that we're on and reducing reducing risk of wildfire to local communities. Those are all parts, parts and pieces. Yeah, and, and our fundamental argument with Fire Sheds Act is, hey, Utah has experienced some success here. Like, let's take what we do here. Let's share this with other states. These, 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 these um, shared stewardship agreements, they're, they're just designed to reduce the amount of bureaucracy to just work together and work, each state can work with their federal agencies. Um, Ms. Hall Rivera, can you describe for us what actions private forest owners take to protect their lands against catastrophic wildfire? Uh, yes, thank you for that question, Congressman. Many private forest landowners uh, do uh, treatment on their landscapes and around their homes to help protect against fire. And we have programs in the Forest Service and the Department of Interior that help support that, working through our state foresters. Uh, but we also know that not every landowner has access to those programs. 
uh, our underserved communities may not be aware of those programs or may not have the capacity to say do grant writing. So we are uh, working together with uh, the National Association of State Foresters and many of our other partners to ensure that um, private landowners know about these programs, they have access to service foresters who can help them do plans for their forests and to ensure that um, we can distribute funding like through the Community Wildfire Defense Grant Program more broadly. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll illustrate, I'll just point out that like there's a lot of tools at private owner's um, disposal and the NEPA regulations that we do sometimes make it impossible for them to do something good and to get, to get past this. Uh, this, uh, this is an argument that we, that we make. We must take a close look at how we can improve NEPA so that it doesn't discourage the kind of management behaviors that our, our federal lands desperately needs. Um, Ms. Uh, Farabee, as I understand it, the Forest Service has been contributing to help fund wildflower corridor projects in coordination with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. As you look to expand this engagement, what efforts, if any, are currently underway to integrate big game uh, wildlife corridors and national forest systems projects? Thank you for the question, Congressman. So as a part of our strategy, we acknowledge um, there are a number of values that are important to us to achieve with our work. While we are looking at mitigating exposure to communities, things like improving habitat um, for wildlife, wildlife species, you know, protecting big game corridors, helping with the recovery of TNE species, protecting critical watersheds, all of those are values that we are also looking to achieve as a result of our work. Thank you. Chair, I've never officially asked three different people three questions within my five minute timeline. So this is a monumental day for me and I wanna thank you all for being a part of this. Um, but the, the point that I, I wanna just- It's likely not to happen again, but proceed. Yeah. Yeah. And the point that I want to just reiterate is there's a lot of good going on, right? And um, I ask people, Utah, and as I've stepped into this role, um, I've seen so much good collaboration taking place in Utah from conservation to wildlife protection across the board. We want to limit emissions being put into and toxins being put into our, in our atmosphere, into our air. And that's all the work that we're doing on on our wildfire work. And we've had great results. And we're not perfect, but we've had great results that I know other states can incorporate. Um, I encourage the majority to, to take a really sincere look at Fire Sheds Act, to look at what the true cause of this is, and we can get out ahead of this if we were, if we were to take an objective and not political look at it. Thank you very much, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair will now recognize uh, for five minutes Ms. Porter from California if she is on. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Ms. Hall Rivera, you've testified in this committee previously about the challenges with wildland firefighter hiring. How many firefighters does the Forest Service need to hire so you have no idle engines, you have fully staffed hotshot crews, and so on? What is the full staffing number? Thank you for that question, Congresswoman. Our goal this year uh, in the Forest Service is 11,300 firefighters. And that is an increase. And what do you have, what do you have right now? Well, I can't tell you the exact number we have right now, Congresswoman, I can get back to you on that. Uh, we are still bringing people on. Of course, it's the time of year where our temporary and even our permanent seasonal firefighters are onboarding. And we do have, uh, we just completed an additional fire hire event in California at the end of March, and those numbers are still coming in. And how did that fire hire event go? Do you think you're on pace to have the number of fully staffed, um, full, being fully staffed in California, do you think you're on pace for that based on the hiring event? Uh, Congressman, yes, I do think we are on pace. And by all accounts, that hiring event went very well. And um, importantly, what we're seeing is a very high acceptance rate in our permanent and seasonally permanent firefighting positions, which is what we want. We want to be able to convert this workforce to have more or a larger proportion of it be permanent and a smaller proportion of it be temporary. Uh, you know, we uh, are in the same boat as uh, a lot of sectors in this country where hiring is difficult and labor is short. But um, by all accounts, th these events are going well, and we think that we will be uh, at the capacity that we need in the Forest Service this year. That's really great to hear because, as you know, um, last year, um, about 30, per according to the National Federation of Federal Employees, about 30% of the federal hotshot crews 
that worked on the front lines of wildfires in California were understaffed. Um, last year, the Forest Service had 60 fire engines in California alone that were idle because of understaffing. So I'm very heartened to hear a concrete number, a concrete goal for what full staffing looks like. The fact that in general, recognizing that everybody faces labor um, challenges and in general, you feel like hiring is going well. And I'm hoping to see that a year from now in the in the outcome. I, I'm hoping to have a number of idle engines and the number of partially staffed, unstaffed um, crews go down. Um, when you don't, if you don't hit that target, and I really appreciate, again, you giving that number, where do you get the people power when you don't have enough firefighters? What happens? Well, as, as we, we don't have enough federal firefighters. Yes. Well, as we've talked about, Congresswoman, uh, fire is an all lands challenge, and we take an all lands approach or a multi jurisdictional approach to uh, fire suppression as well. And we and we always have done that in this country. And so we are able to uh, to flux our numbers of uh, firefighters across the country. The couple of different ways that we do that. Uh, one, contractors, uh, Department of the Interior and the Forest Service, we both employ contractors and we can uh, staff up using that mechanism. We also, in both of our agencies, have employees who are not full-time firefighters but do have fire qualifications. They have what's called a red card and we can bring them on during high periods of fire activity. We also have an authority called administratively determined, which allows us to bring on others. They, they tend to be people who are retired or, or otherwise uh, no longer engaged in, in the firefighting, but they are red carded and we are allowed to bring them on. So we can surge. We had upwards of what, 29,000 firefighters on the landscape last year during our highest levels of activity. Do you ever have to hire local fire departments um, or CAL FIRE, and how much did you spend um, at Forest Service last year on borrowing resources from local or state fire departments? We have an agreement. Uh, we have agreements with uh, state and local firefighters all over the country. Uh, we have a particularly a robust agreement with uh, California. It's called the California Fire Assistance Agreement, and Interior is part of that as well. And we are able to uh, activate uh, local and volunteer uh, fire departments through that agreement, and it's reciprocal. Um, they go on our fires, we go on their fires. So it's a really great example of uh, intergovernmental cooperation in the fire space. Just for cleaning my time, Ms. Hall Rivera, would you be able to later provide um, the cost of those reciprocal agreements? I know they're they're complicated, um, but if you could provide a cost number to the committee, is that something you'd be able to do later? Yes, Congressman, we'd be happy to do that. And Mr. Rupert, could you do the same thing, please, for the Department of Interior? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, my last question was was just to ask Mr. Faraby, um, could you just say briefly, particularly for Southern California, um, what you think the bipartisan infrastructure bill is, is going to be doing to benefit our community? Yes, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. So, our, you know, our strategy is really looking at um, critical fire sheds that is based on um, a lot of fire history as well as um, ignition sources and vegetative communities. And the intent of that is really to mitigate exposure to communities like those in Southern California. And so we want to place an effort and emphasis in those fire sheds, working very closely with counties and states and tribal governments, as well as a number of other partners in the community to determine where we should be treating within those fire sheds to make a difference. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. McClintock, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Farabee, the Forest Service used to have what was called the 10 a.m. rule. It was uh, basically an informal policy that uh, any fires spotted would be put it out to by 10 o'clock the next morning. Uh, we had the Tamarack fire last year in uh, Alpine County. Uh, lightning bolt struck a tree. Uh, that tree uh, smoldered on about a quarter of an acre for about 10 days. Every day the Forest Service had helicopters flying over to take pictures for Facebook, but never bothered to drop a bucket of water on it, put the damn thing out. On the 10th day it exploded, uh, uh, took out 70,000 acres, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, devastating uh, the, the uh, local community, which depends upon tourism, uh, uh, cost a number of families their homes. What in the world were you people thinking? <laughs> so thank you for the question, Ms. Clintock. And I will um, allow my uh, colleague, um, Ms. Rivera, to, to address that. 
Yes, I'd be happy to talk about that. Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Um, you know, the Tamarack fire is one of those challenges that we have when we have hundreds of large fires on the landscape and we're at preparedness yeah, but, but, levels. Wait, wait a second, wait a second though. This was, this was a fire that could have been put out with, with, with one aerial drop and maybe a ground crew. Uh, instead, you allowed it to explode to 70,000 acres. It cost us millions and millions of dollars uh, to combat uh, and did enormous damage not only to the forest but the surrounding communities. Why aren't we getting on top of these fires when they first break out, when we can easily put them out, rather than waiting for them to explode? And this is not the first time this has happened. It's happened over and over again. It's happened on Park Service land as well. We had the, uh, the Reading Fire about a decade ago. Same thing. On the very same fire uh, uh, footprint as the Tamarack, we had the Woodfords Fire about 30 years ago. Same thing exactly. Small fire breaks out. In that case, the local fire department came to put it out and were told to go away by the Forest Service. This is insane. Please tell me that you're dropping that policy and that you will be at vigorously attacking uh, fires on, on their initial discovery uh, rather than waiting for them to come, become these massive conflagrations. Yes, Congressman, uh, we uh, put out 98% of fires on initial attack. And the Tamarack fire is one of those 2% that we were not able to do that because we were resource limited in the country as a whole. You knew about it. You deliberately sat on it. And again, not the first time this has happened. It's happened over and over again. That was the cause of the disastrous Yellowstone fires in 1988 when the Reagan administration rescind the let burn policy. And then you put it back after the Reagan administration left. Well, let me assure you, Congressman, we do not have a let burn policy in the Forest Service. We manage every fire. We monitor every Can fire. Can you assure me that henceforth, uh, upon discovery of a fire, you will order an aggressive initial attack? Yes, Congressman. That is what we do. All right. Thank you. Uh, next question involves the management of our forests. Uh, we used to send foresters out every year uh, to, uh, to mark off surplus timber. We'd then auction that timber off for bid. Uh, we actually made money on those timber auctions. Uh, logging companies paid us to come in, remove that excess timber. We have 25% of those revenues went to the local communities directly affected. The other 75% went back to the Forest Service for forest management. We passed laws in the 1970s that made uh, the uh, uh, thinning of our forests uh, endlessly time consuming and ultimately cost prohibitive. The millions of dollars uh, that it takes to do the environmental impact reports now uh, cost more than the value of the timber, so not a lot is getting done. We got a categorical exclusion from NEPA uh, for the uh, Tahoe Basin uh, for ten, uh, projects up to 10,000 acres. The Forest Service has been using that very, very effectively. Uh, I think that's what so saved South Lake Tahoe from the Caldor fire when that fire hit the treated portion under that new authority, which was uh, assigned in, in 2016. Uh, the fire lay down. They were able to extinguish it before it took out the city of South Lake Tahoe. Why are can't we do that throughout the Forest Service system? It's, it's a proven success. Why don't we extend that throughout the Forest Service? Thank you for the question, Congressman. And to your, to your question, yes, we can do that across the national forest system lands. Um, we're using a number of category exclusions, if you will. And what, what, what I've been told, this category exclusion takes the uh, uh, review process from four years down to less than four months takes the EIR from about 800 pages down to about 20 pages and actually gets stuff done. Will the Forest Service support legislation to extend uh, uh, this provision across all Forest Service lands? The agency is currently using them to the degree that we absolutely can. We would support working with you on any future legislation that enhances the tools that we have to really um, address the, the uh, needs we have when it comes to managing the national forest. Great. Thank you. Gentlemen's uh, time has expired. The chair will now recognize uh, Ms. Tlaib from Michigan for five minutes. I didn't know where the button was. Uh, thank you so much, chair. Uh, thank you all for the witnesses uh, for today that are here. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is how, you know, our agencies are implementing Justice 40 and delivering benefits uh, to dis disadvantaged communities, or I call my frontline communities, like the ones I represent. Um, because I think many folks across our nation will wonder how wildlife management and ecosystem restoration impacts them. 
So, Mr. Rupert, I'll start with you. How is the Department of the Interior incorporating Justice 40 initiative into consideration of certain projects using the infrastructure funding? Yes, thank you. Um, in Interior, um, up to this point, as we've um, begun to focus work on implementing um, infrastructure, um, we've taken a, a, a program by program, so uh, many different provisions um, um, of infrastructure, crossing multiple programs um, in Interior, looking at programs for opportunities um, to highlight and, and, and um, um, promote. Um, Justice 40, and then um, as the administration has been working um, um, at an all of government level to develop support and tools, um, um, then we will interact with, with those tools as they come online um, to, to provide that focused mm -hmm. priority support. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Fairby or Ms. Hall Rivera, is the Forest Service also incorporating uh, the Justice 40 initiative into their 10 year wildlife plan and infrastructure implementation? Yes, yes, we are. Um, to, the, to date, we've uh, identified covered programs within our organization. We've identified priorities that would benefit tribes, underserved communities, and disadvantaged communities as well, and have developed indicators um, to help us track, you know, um, how we're how we're progressing in that arena, and as well have developed an implementation plan that'll help modify um, how we currently show up, um, so that we can can serve those communities as better as we would like. Well, one of my concerns about the infrastructure bill is that it did strip requirements out of the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, that will fast track certain projects without full environmental reviews. Are you all aware of that? No, I'm not, I'm not sure, Congresswoman, well, what Mr. you're Well, Mr. Farabee, the Department of Interior's Wildlife Spend Plan identifies several different criteria um, to inform its work and prioritize infrastructure funding, the first of which is a completed nat uh, national environmental policy, you know, NEPA compliance. Um, how has NEPA worked to protect critical uh, species habitat and conservation areas, as well as prioritize project work? Just want to show my colleagues how important it is. So the, the Forest Service has um, equal criteria, if you will, that we are using um, when it comes to implementing this work as it relates to our strategy. One is to ensure that we are compliant with NEPA. The other one is we meet the intent of the bill itself. And, and thirdly, we want to make sure that the work that we're looking to uh, invest in uh, aligns with the science that we have informing where we should be investing. And, you know, and I know NEPA is important, and even in front like community like mine, you know, when they're building an international bridge crossing, how, you know, NEPA has been actually helped mitigate some of the issues regarding air quality. Um, and, and I don't know if this is for Mr. Uh, Faraby or Ms. Hall Rivera, but, you know, how many projects or acres have been completed under NEPA compliance that you're all aware of? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I can't give you... Um, exact um, acres or um, the number of projects, what I can assure you is that all the projects that we implement at the ground level have met our NEPA, NEPA compliance requirement. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of is there's now exceptions. Um, so it's clear to me that our work didn't end with the infrastructure bill. So to any of the witnesses, how would the investments in the House passed Build Back Better Act allow your agencies to continue to address climate, wildlife, community needs? Do you believe the investments um, beyond infrastructure might be necessary to achieve desired outcomes? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. So we are very appreciative of the financial support and the provisions within the bipartisan infrastructure law. And as we've we've indicated, we acknowledge that given the level of treatment that's needed and the scale of the issue, we acknowledge that the, the bill in and of itself is a great down payment towards um, achieving that work. Yeah. Thank you. Chairman, I yield. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Rosendale from Montana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I assure you, we in Montana are very concerned about forest management. Um, we welcome our, you to the committee. It impacts our air quality, our water quality, our economy, and our, our just way of life. So it's critically important to us. Uh, Mr. Rupert and Ms. Hall-Rivera, 
Could you tell me how many timber sales in the Montana area or the United States Forest Service Region 1 are currently stalled due to litigation? I'll take that question, uh, Congressman. I don't have that number, but uh, I can ask our team to get that for you. So I'm assuming that you wouldn't have the acreage that that would uh, cover as well. No, I don't, but I know that we can easily get that information for you. Okay, well, it took me many months to get that. You might be interested to know, probably about six months to be exact. And finally, it was provided to me. In Montana, 27 timber sales are currently tied up, totaling 188 million board feet of timber. In Region 1, Montana and Idaho combined, that number jumps to 41 sales tied up, or 438 Point thirty five million board feet of timber that is being tied up and not being brought to market, nor out of the forest to help keep our forest healthy. That's approximately 35,162 acres that are tied up in litigation in Region 1, completely stalling proper forest management. I'm glad to see there was funding included in the infrastructure bill for forest management. But to be completely candid with you, that money is going to do squat if it can't be spent because all these projects are tied up with litigation. I've attended and gone into the field and visited Lubrick Research Lab, which is a forest management operation, and have seen the difference between forests that is properly managed through mechanical treatment, through fire treatment, through both fire and mechanical treatment, and forest that has not been touched at all. And not only does it make for a very unhealthy condition for the forest, and the trees themselves are unhealthy, but it creates an incredible fire hazard. And this is some of the things that's leading to the very hot fires that are out of control that my colleagues here have been talking about. What must I do to get the support of you folks sitting here today on forest management litigation reform, such as the legislation that I introduced in HR 4579. Thank you for the question, Congressman. Well, I am um, not aware exactly what your piece of legislation in, you know, entails. We'd be more than happy to work with you. Um, the agency is very interested in having all the tools possible for us to be able to address the active management need that we see on the landscape to mitigate and reduce the kind of wildfires that we're experiencing. Again, we know what it requires, proper management. We've seen it demonstrated in the field. It's not rocket science, no, no offense. We just need it to be implemented. And the only way that we're gonna be able to implement it is if we have proper litigation reform, and that's where I need your support. Does the Endangered Species Act have any impact on forest management? So, you know, the Endangered Species Act is one of the many legal requirements that our agency is obligated to, to meet the intent of. And, you know, our agency is, is about the sustainability of all of our natural resources that includes species that are covered under the act. I understand that. But again, does the Endangered Species Act negatively uh, impact the proper management of our forest? I can... Thank you for the question, Congressman. I can't say that it negatively impacts. I would just say it's a condition of which we have to consider in the management of our activities when we're planning projects. So is the habitat that is located in a healthy forest that we certainly would be able to manage the wildlife population as well, if we have a forest that is not properly managed, we have fuels build up, we have a wildfire take place, it completely sterilizes the soil, because it has burned so hot, it then creates problems with erosion, water quality problems, fisheries problems. You don't think that that, again, I will ask, do you not think that that negatively impacts the habitat and the very species that we're trying to preserve? Thank you for the question again, Congressman. Uh, the way that you described that lastly, I would say, yes, we've experienced a number of post-fire situations that's not conducive to resilient landscapes or um, habitat for wildlife. Mr. Chair, I see that my time has expired, so I would yield back. Gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Gomert, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here today. 
Um, last year, we'd sent a letter to the Forest Service um, asking about boat ramps on Lake Sam Rayburn in my district. Um, the, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the history of the national forests, but local state governments were uh, assured that by providing land that could not be taxed and would not be used for commercial purposes, that uh, the U.S. Forest Service would share 25% of the proceeds of the timber harvesting uh, with the local government. Uh, back in the 80s, uh, uh, for example, Sabine County had $1.6 million as their shared portion, a uh, very rural county. But uh, in recent years, it's dropped as low as 60,000. And then with the so-called stewardship program, I know it's, uh, according to Mr. Westerman, it's been helpful in Arkansas, but in East Texas, it seems to be used to hide money from being shared with local government. Um, we've run into problems where like, where a culvert is, um, a bridge goes down, a culvert, um, becomes impassable, that it's as if the U.S. Forest Service likes the area being um, uh, unable to traverse for local residents. We have boat ramps that have ceased being used, and uh, in, it took over four months, but we got a response, quote, the boat ramp is not sustainable from a structural or financial perspective, and that, quote, using volunteers is neither safe nor practical. So when you have, uh, and, and we don't, in case you're not familiar, we don't have any sequoias, redwoods, we got pine trees. And newer pine trees uh, actually sequester more carbon, if you're not familiar, and so it ends up being uh, one of our best renewable resources. Uh, 20, 25 years, you plant pine trees and they're back in East Texas. They can be harvested. The older they get, the less carbon they sequester. But uh, it just seems that regardless of the administration, the U.S. Forest Service is doing a great disservice uh, to East Texas and other places, uh, the trees are not being harvested, the resource is not being renewed, um, and uh, we had a deputy in San Augustine County chase a criminal into the National Forest, but stopped in order to get permission, and he was in hot pursuit. Uh, I think it was about five days later after lots of screaming by a lot of us. Uh, someone was sent from Arizona to come check things out and was surprised to find the most sophisticated marijuana growing area that they'd ever experienced. But because of the uh, lack of assistance from the U.S. Forest Service aiding and abetting uh, the getaway of those who constructed the marijuana growing service. Uh, they got a little ahead of the game of it being legalized. Uh, they were free to go to some other national forest and again, continue to engage in criminality. So we haven't gotten a whole lot of help nor a lot of cooperation out of the U.S. Forest Service. And if we get uh, a, an administration so amenable, I'm gonna be pushing hard to uh, get land given back to local communities so that uh, they don't continue in their struggle just to survive because the U.S. For Forest Service has become so blasé about doing what it originally agreed to do. Um, I realize I've got 10 seconds left and haven't arrived at a question but I wanted to make sure that you knew how unpalatable the U.S. Forest Service has become in East Texas 
and uh, we're hoping that we can bring it to an end unless you turn about very quickly in helping the local area instead of hurting it. I yield back. Gen gentleman yields back. I'd, I'd give the witnesses an opportunity to respond if they'd like to, but if not, we'll proceed. Yeah, oh, I, I, I didn't realize I'd made a question there. Um, so, yeah, thanks for extending my time, Chair. My pleasure. I would like to respond because I think it's the, the points that you brought up are very important, Congressman. And, um, you know, I would say all of our leaders in the field pride themselves on their relationships that they have with their state and local partners. Um, but it's not always perfect, and we can do better. And um, so it's important that, you know, we heard your concerns and, and I can commit that, um, you know, we, we, will, um, we will work on those in, in Texas. Um, you know, I think our, uh, our district rangers and our poor supervisor there are always going to be wanting to improve their relationships, I can assure you of that. But, but you, you understand when someone's in hot pursuit, taking five days to give permission is really not helpful, right? And when you shut down the boat ramps that would help provide, you know, fishing tournaments, things like that, some source for the economy, uh, and you continue to shut them down, shut down camping areas, that's not what the locals consider to be extremely cooperative. You, you get that, right? Yes, I understand what you're saying, Congressman. Well, we'd love to hear a better response than, no, it's just not going to work out. Aren't you glad that I gave the witnesses an opportunity to respond? <laughs> Um, before we conclude with this witness panel, are there any other members who have not had their five minutes uh, and who wish to seek recognition to ask questions now? I don't know if we have anybody virtually. Hearing none, uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. Uh, look, these are tough issues, and so uh, no shortage of um, you know, very nuanced and, and difficult questions, and I think thorough and insightful answers. We appreciate the partnership. Uh, and we'll look forward to continuing to work with the administration on these issues and more. Uh, the members of the committee may have uh, some additional questions for the witnesses, and we will ask you to respond uh, to those in writing. Under Committee Rule 3, subparagraph O, members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following this hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days uh, for these responses. So if there is no other form, uh, further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you.